reflection. And the, the, the beauty of the Qur'an is when you study a single ayah and you ponder over a single ayah and you look at our incredible tradition of so many scholars that poured over every single ayah, you could literally do a PhD thesis on one ayah. You could, even if you just collected what's been said and didn't do any thinking of your own, you just copied what's been said before you, those would be thousands of pages on one ayah, right? But that doesn't take away from the fact that we're in fact reading a book. And in a book, there's continuity, right? And when you focus on one thing and you talk exhaustively about one thing, that one ayah or that one statement, it kind of like, it becomes a chapter. And when you're in a chapter, you lose sight of the fact that there was something before it and there's something after it and there's a kind of continuity. To make this easier to understand, this challenge, you can think of it like if you're, you know, if you're in a helicopter or you're on top of, forget helicopter, you're on top of a mountain and you see a field of flowers, of all different color flowers. You see the entire picture, it's a beautiful scene, right? And you're a good photographer, you take a picture of this, this scene, right? Then you go descend into the valley and you kind of focus your camera in on, on like a single flower and the, actually the, the very center of the flower and a petal from within that flower and you take a color of how marvelous the texture and the color is of that. Now both of these things have their own beauty, right? But in one picture you kind of see the beauty of the entire landscape. And in another you, you're zooming in on the beauty of this one little piece. But they both have not only an advantage but also a disadvantage. On the one hand when you focus in on one thing, what happens? You lose sight of the whole thing. You don't realize where you are. You know, that becomes a world by itself. And if you look at the whole thing, you do get a big picture, but you lose sight of the beautiful small details. So the study of the Qur'an is actually a challenge in many ways because on the one hand, we want to focus on every little detail, right? Everything okay? Good. Oh, good, okay. So you want to focus on every little detail. But at the same time, there's a beauty in the landscape. There's a beauty in, you know, how the kalam, how the speech of Allah is flowing. So I want to start today, inshallah, with just a little bit of an overview and something I didn't highlight before of where we are. We are now entering, and I, I started it yesterday without formally announcing it. We entered into the story of creation. We entered into the story of Adam alayhi uh, salam. And the, the, the story of uh, you know, the, how Allah Azza wa made the announcement to, you, to the angels that He's going to put someone on the earth, a khalifa on the earth. We got into that discussion. But what led us to that discussion? You had the first passage about believers. I think everybody here remembers that. I emphasize that quite a bit. The second passage was about disbelievers and along with the hypocrites. That was our second discussion. It was a much longer discussion. And I even showed you a screen of how symmetrical that conversation was. The third conversation was actually a call to all of humanity beginning with Ya ayyuhan nasu abudu rabbakum. This is ayah number 21 onwards. The story of Adam is ayah number 30. So what's happening from 21 to 30? There's a, there's a proclamation made to all of humanity that they should worship their master. And why should they, and what's the call that Allah made? You should be a abid of Allah. You should become enslaved and worship Allah willingly because He's the one who made you and made the ones who came much before you, right? And then He said another thing in addition. He said, He's the same one who made the earth as a bedding for you. And He put the sky above you as a, as a canopy and He put it up above you as a construct, right? And then he sent water from the sky, all of that. That was in the beginning. You'll notice at the end of this passage, it's exactly those concepts that are repeated. First Allah says, how could you disbelieve you used to be dead? You remember that? And he brought you to life. And, but the question was, how could you disbelieve? So the passage began, worship Allah. And it ends, how could you disbelieve? The passage began, Allah said, worship the one who made you and, the ones who he, and, the, and he made the ones who came much before you. And then at the end he says, look, all of you were dead. And he brought all of you back to life. It's actually the same subject repeating itself. And then in the beginning he said he made the earth. And then he said he made the sky as a, as a roof over you. And by the end he says, So where that passage began is actually where it's also ending. It's reviewing everything. And it, by the way, started with the story of human beings being created, and it ends with the story of human beings being created. It starts with the skies and the earth, and it ends with the skies and the earth. The next subject matter in that previous chunk, that 21 to 30 chunk that we were studying, Allah Azza wa Jal talked about how people are, people disparage, or they don't appreciate, or they tend to undermine the revelation of Allah. And Allah challenged humanity and said, look, if you don't think this is revelation, why don't you do what? What was the challenge that He issued? Why don't you make a surah? Why don't you make one for yourself? You know, and call any witnesses you want. 
let's, let's see what you can do. On the flip side of it, he said, well, if you can't make a surah, all you do is make complaints about why does the Qur'an have this example, why does it have that example, you know? And so on both sides, you have people trying to disparage or undermine the word of Allah. But what fascinates me the most about this cluster of ayat, it's symmetrical, right? Beginning, the beginning and the end match. The second concept and the second last concept match. But what really gets to me is what is in the middle. And that's the reason I brought this up. What is in the middle is وَبَشِّرِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أَنَّ لَهُمْ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ كُلَّمَا رُزِقُوا مِنْهَا مِنْ ثَمَرَةٍ رِزْقًا قَالُوا هَذَا الَّذِي رُزِقْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِ وَأُتُوا بِهِ مُتَشَابِهًا وَلَهُمْ فِيهَا أَزْوَاجٌ مُطَهَّرَةٌ وَهُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ That's the middle ayah of that entire series of ayat. What is that middle ayah? Congratulate believers and those who've done good deeds that they're going to have gardens the bottoms of which rivers are going to be flowing. Remember the discussion we had about Jannah? You guys had too much fun in that night? Yeah. Right, we talked about Jannah? Yeah. That ayah of Jannah is right in the middle. Now think about this for a second. It is in the middle. In the beginning of that passage, there's the creation of the skies and the earth and the human beings. At the end of that passage is the creation of the skies and the earth and the human beings. And in the heart of that passage is what? Congratulate believers that what is waiting for them? Jannah, Jannah is waiting for them. This is beautiful because this is the per that center of the passage is actually the heart of the matter. Why is Allah telling you all of this? Why is He challenging you to accept guidance? Why is He reminding you He's the one who made you and you used to be in His company? Because He wants you back where you used to be. Where? In Jannah. And so in this next passage, we come back to the heart of the matter and we begin with the story of Adam salam. And Adam salam's story begins where? It begins in Jannah. And notice also the description that Allah made of Jannah in that ayah, in that central ayah of the previous passage. What, was it? what were some elements of that story? Allah Azza wa Jal said, okay, gardens and rivers flowing, and then Allah specifically highlighted, they're going to have any kind of fruit they want. Yeah? كُلَّمَا رُزِقُوا مِنْهَا مِنْ ثَمَرَةٍ رِزْقَ And what do you, I think everybody here knows what I'm about to get at. When you study the story of Adam alayhi salam, what's the sticking point? Where does the trouble begin? With a tree and a fruit. With a tree and a fruit. And now Allah is actually already alluding to the fact that when I send you back, even that tree is going to be halal. <laughs> even that. Even every single one. Thamaratin. For, for the mufrad, right? This is Masdar Marra, it's called even. The Tamar Butal al Marra. For a single instant of a fruit. But now, but when, he, when it started, there was that one single fruit. As a matter of fact, that tree even don't go near it. So there's a reference to that. Then Allah added, they're going to have spouses that are purified for them. And you'll find what in the story of Adam alayhi salam? Uskun anta wa zawjuka. Azwaja mutahara. The first zawj was mutahara. And that's actually a very important reference from which we're going to begin. So the, the first thing I wanted to give you is kind of how beautifully the ayat of the Qur'an and the passages of the Qur'an mentally prepare the believer for what's coming. If you ponder over them, there's a beautiful flow. There's an absolutely fascinating flow to the word of Allah. Now let's talk, in today's conversation inshallah, I, uh, I wanted to set the tone for the story of Adam alayhi salam, I'll tell you certain elements of the story today. Maybe we won't get to too many ayat, but if I have, if I can give you that foundational, uh, uh, you know, thought process, then inshallah, when we do get into the text, you'll appreciate it entirely differently. So today is a, really an educational, you know, a teaching session for the purpose of, you know, uh, understanding the ayat that are coming. Okay. So the first thing I want to start with is this is the most known story in human history. You know, like. The story of creation from the Jewish people and of course by the majority population of the world, the Christian people, is one of the most popular stories in history. Everybody knows the story of creation. As a matter of fact, I've met many Muslim kids around the world, around the country and around the world whose concept of the story of creation is influenced by Christian and Jewish ideas. Like they don't actually know the Quran or Islamic account, they figure it's all probably the same. So they imagine Adam and Eve wearing some kind of lion skin or something in a garden and you know they're, they're not entirely appropriately dressed and there's a tree, it's probably an apple you know or something and there's this, the, the devil takes what form? A snake, a serpent, this is all from Jewish and Christian tradition, this has not, there's no serpent in the Quran there's no, there's no snake in the Quran, there's no like this kind of clothing that's described of, of uh, animal skin or anything like that you know, no, no such description exists. But this, this imagery has been made so popular that it's even entered subconsciously in the minds of even Muslims. But let's not go there for a second. Let's understand some basic elements of the story as the world knows it. 
The Quran came along and told the story in a way that the world did not know. The world had forgotten. The story as it was popular even at the time of the revelation of the Quran, some elements of it you need to understand. And they're still alive and well today. Most people don't know the Quran version, most people know the popular version of the story. God creates humanity, and by the way, even I told you when he asked the angels, should I create man? That's actually not part of the popular literature, that's extra biblical text. So most people didn't even know that part. God just decides to create the human being and he puts him in heaven and you know the devil takes the form of a serpent and the serpent goes and man was lonely so God took his you know man's rib and he molded it and he turned it into to Eve and they were living in, in heaven happily and the serpent was very jealous of them and he went to snake the devil went and he convinced the woman Eve uh, he convinced her that she should eat from that tree and that tree they call it the tree of good and evil the knowledge of good and evil and actually God is very angry at them from the very beginning don't you dare go near that tree because that is actually uh, you know if they eat from this tree they'll become like gods the, the, the concept was if they eat from that tree they'll become divine beings and gods doesn't mean aliha in old language gods even means angel like beings so they'll become heavenly creatures and God didn't want that he didn't want that goodness for Adam and Eve, so he wanted to keep them away from that tree. Some accounts even say that God had like a, a guardian angel with a fiery sword standing by the tree so nobody would come near that tree. Like they had this, this, this a very protective situation in the biblical account about the tree, right? And don't go near it. And the serpent comes and he doesn't come to both of them. Who does he come to? He comes to Eve and he tells her, you need to eat from this tree because if you have this tree, if you eat from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then you're going to have eternal life. That's what you need to do. And you need to convince. And then she goes and she convinces Adam. And Adam then takes the decision and goes and eats. And of course then he blames her and she blames the devil, nobody takes responsibility for themselves. That's the account, actually the biblical account is, Adam blamed the woman, he blamed Eve. And Eve blamed the devil. And now there's another additional point. When they did eat from the tree, God is extremely angry. Allah is extremely angry at them. And he basically, it's like an, it's a moment of rage in the biblical account. And he, as a punishment, sends them where? To the earth. That's, this is a punishment for you. You are cursed now because of this crime that you have committed. And he particularly comes after the woman. Like there's like this extra anger at the woman because at the end of the day, the devil didn't go to Adam. The devil went to Eve and Eve went to Adam. So she seduced him to do wrong, right? So he has extra anger at her and says, for what you have done, you will bleed every month and you're going to cry when you give birth and you're going to suffer and man shall have kingdom or power over you man will be in charge of you. And like, th these are the punishments sp specifically, and the curse is specifically for the female as humanity is brought to this earth. And from then on, they are now going to be born into sin. The, 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 the humanity is going to pay the price of the sin of Adam. Right? And th so this world is basically a cursed situation for humanity. The Qur'an, when it speaks of this account, by the way, if you, if you accept that account, the Christians and the Jews from there on, what they do with the story is interesting. Of course, there are lots of denominations of Christians and Jews, but just generalizing, the Christian account is, well, human beings were born into sin, we were cursed, and of course Jesus came, and through his blood we're all saved. He sacrificed for the sins of humanity, the sins we could never have paid for, the sins that started with who? Our father, right? Quran comes along, and from the very beginning, it starts shattering this notion. And it starts, like the way that Allah tells the story, especially in Baqarah, is so unique. Every piece of it is so unique that I'm going to do a few things. My goal is a few things today. In the beginning, I'm going to tell you a crazy story that has nothing to do with this. Uh, then I'll tell you another crazy story that has nothing to do with this, but they both have something to do with it by the end. Okay? That's my goal. Okay? So, the first crazy story is something I made up. This is entirely my own concoction. It's, it is uh, uh, you know, my own deviation. If you can appreciate it, you can, if not. Because I think everybody here basically kind of sort of knows what happened, right? Uh, you know, Adam and Hawa were in Jannah. Uh, Shaitan whispered, they ate from the tree, they were expelled. That's the, the basic elements of the story everybody here is familiar with, okay? So I'm going to tell you a story. And this is again my own invention. It's horrible. Um, you have somebody who, started, who got a job at a company. He got a job as um, mid-level. 
And he started working very hard, very hard, impressed his manager. Eventually, he was made into manager after a couple of years. After a couple of years, after that, he was made into regional manager. Then he was made into like the manager for sales or head of sales for the entire United States. And then he was granted even US and Europe. And he just keeps moving up 20, 30 years of service in this company. And this guy keeps getting promoted and promoted and promoted and promoted, right? Eventually, he's the VP of the company. This guy, after 35 years of serving in this company, moving up, proving himself is now the VP. There's only one position higher than VP, which is what? The, the owner of the company, the president of the company. Okay, so he's the right-hand man. And they, they have a headquarters, which is like this tall sky, skyscraper office. And he's got like the, one of the best offices on the top floor, right next to the president's office, the CEO's office. That's the VP's office. He enjoys his position there, right? And he's been serving there. Everybody shows him respect. You know, pe people, you know, stand when he walks by and things like that. And then one day, the president of the company, the CEO, walks in with a 16-year-old teenager who's chewing gum and looking around. And he says, hey, I'd like, you to, intro I'd like to introduce you to our new VP. And uh, if you could just get off that chair, because that's his chair now. And I think he likes chocolate milk, so if you could get him some from downstairs the cafeteria, that'd be good too. <laughs> the president walks in, tells his VP that the 16-year-old kid is now the VP. And he needs to be at the service of this new, new, new hire, right? If you are even like a secretary in the office, and you're on the side like typing away, you'll stop typing for a second. You're like, what just happened? And you're going to want to hear what happens next. Now, if I don't even tell you what happens next in the story, can you imagine what would happen next? Can you imagine the kind of reaction? Would, there would be an abrupt <coughs> eruption, a volcanic eruption, coming from who? The v like, what? Who's he? What are his qualifications? Do you know what I've done for this company? Do you know how much time I've put in? Do you know how much I, I gave up like, my family for this company? I gave up my life, I gave my sweat, blood, and tears for the, and you're gonna just put me away? Who is he? What is he? What degree does he have? Does he even know how to spell? <laughs> you're gonna put him in my place? There's this like eruption. And anybody watching, if I was, if this was a movie that directed by myself, produced by myself, <laughs> my intention would actually be to make you feel bad for who? You'd all sympathize with the VP. Like, that's not right. That isn't cool, you know. But you know, I'm not talking about a VP. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about Iblis. I mean, he was in the service of Allah. And he is a jinn. And despite being a jinn, being promoted so much that Allah would put him in the rank of the angels. He's proven himself, obviously. And then for Allah to create something made of dirt and then tell him, by the way, thank you, he's taking your place. He's the one to be promoted to Khalifa of the earth. He flips out and we're like, Astaghfirullah, Shaitan, Iblis. If this was a story about a VP, you'd be like, yeah man, that ain't cool. I, you know, I, I, I sympathize with the guy. Now that's one side of the story. Let's hold it there. Because I wanted you to sympathize with the VP. I know it's disturbing that you might sympathize with the devil. Hold on, hold your thoughts. But you, you need to understand what's happening in the story from a thematic point of view. It's very powerful. Now I'll tell you another story. Yet another story is, you work at a company, and you're doing a good job. You seem to be doing okay. And your boss sends an email to the entire department. The only one he doesn't send an email to is who? You. you. And the email says, that we're going to transfer Abdullah next week to New Jersey. The New Jersey office, as a punishment. I think he's better suited not for Texas, he's suited for New Jersey. Inna lillahi wa inna Everybody knows he's about to be transferred. The only one who doesn't know is who? Himself. Himself. Everybody knows the transfer orders have come. You know, they've already prepared everybody that he's going to be transferred and he doesn't know. Okay. Now, what happens is one of his friends who got the email says, listen, I know you didn't get the email. Can I show you what happened? They're going to transfer you. They're going to transfer you. The next day, Abdullah comes 10 minutes late. He's upset anyway. He comes 10 minutes late to the office. 
The boss calls him into the office. The boss says to him, you were 10 minutes late. I don't think you're suited for Texas. I think we need to transfer you to New Jersey. The boss says, what are you talking about? You had already decided that you're going to send me where? To New Jersey. Out of Jannah. I mean Texas. <laughs> <laughs> You're going you're gonna to send me out of here. You already issued the memo. You're not sending me there because I messed up or I came 10 minutes late. That was always part of your plan. This whole drama about, oh, you messed up and that's why I'm sending you down, please. I have a copy of the email. My friend gave it to me. In other words, this was all pre-planned, wasn't it? And it's not because I messed up. I'm not really talking about Abdullah in New Jersey. Who am I talking about? Adam alayhi salam. Allah Azza wa Jalla. The first thing we learn is Inni ja'ilun fil jannati khalifa. Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. I'm going to put someone left behind, someone who's going to have children after children after children, someone who shall take responsibility where? On the earth. He hasn't eaten from any tree yet. He hasn't, he hasn't done anything yet. And yet the plan is, and all the angels know, he's supposed to go where? On the earth. Now, this portion of the Qur'an in Baqarah is not the portion where you find out the conversation between Adam and Iblis. You don't find this conversation here. You find that conversation in Surah Al-A'raf and other places. There, Iblis comes to him and says, listen, you know that whole tree thing? Let me tell you what's going on. If you ate from that tree, it's impossible to transfer you to New Jersey. You would get permanent residence in Texas. That's why he doesn't want you to eat from the tree, because everybody knows that you've been actually, the orders for your transfer have already been issued. You are about to go where? To the earth. And you're like, is earth like Jannah? No, no, it's not like this. This, this is Jannah. You want it, the only people who get to stay here are angels or permanent residents. There's only two kinds of people that can stay up here. Angels or permanent. And takuna malakaini aw takuna min al khalidin. Either you both convert to angels or you both become permanent residents. And the only way to do that is to eat from that tree. Because otherwise, look, the, the decision has been made. Final, you are sent. You're in the ja'inun fil ardi khalifa. It's done. That's uh, commonly known. Now, even though Adam alayhi salam eats from the tree, and Allah Azza wa Jal apparently says, now as consequence of your eating from the tree, you must go down to the earth. Couldn't he turn around and say, excuse me? What about inni ja'ilun fil ardi? Iblis came and told me you were going to send me anyway. You're not sending me because of the tree. You're sent, oh, because I ate from the fruit. I actually, I knew I was going to get sent anyway. Why is that question important? The question is important because until this day, the oldest question in philosophy and the oldest question in the mind of anyone who has a crisis of faith is if Allah knows already what I'm going to do and where I'm going to end up, why should I be held responsible? The question of predestination is something that's asked for centuries upon centuries upon centuries. If Allah already knows, how is it my fault? If Allah already planned everything, why should I be held responsible? And the, sto the first story, the first man to exist, the first human being actually had the opportunity to ask the oldest question in philosophy. Because <laughs> he, he was put in that position. It was predestined that he will come on the earth. Now I've presented you two very precarious situations. You've got the story of Iblis, who is being demoted apparently unfairly. And you've got the story of Adam, who actually is going to be transferred no matter what. They're going to be, he's going to be sent anyway. And then they're both, by the way, both of them, they have a lot in common. This is the next thing I want you to understand. Adam salam and Iblis have a lot in common. Iblis was ranked above the angels. He was given superiority. He was given a superior position. Was Adam salam given a rank above the angels? Yeah, usjudu li Adam. He was given a superior position. Iblis was given this honor, Adam was given this honor, Iblis ended up disobeying Allah. Adam also disobeyed Allah. Iblis actually disobeyed Allah that one time. Adam also disobeys Allah that one time. 
Now, they're, all, they're also both sent to the earth. And by the way, both of them had logical explanation. They could have had logical explanations for disobedience. Why am I saying that? I compared Iblis to the VP, remember? Does the VP have a logical complaint? Does he have a logical complaint? Yeah. yeah. If Adam alayhi salam is being sent to the earth, he can also make a logical complaint. Look, you were going to send me down anyway. He can make a logical complaint. So now what they have in common thus far is both of them are in a position to challenge the decision of God with a logical complaint. They have that in common. Where do the differences begin? The differences begin with one of them saying, here is my logical complaint, here is why your command makes no sense. And the other one says, logic or not, whether I think it's fair or not, I know one thing that trumps my own thinking, I know you're never unfair. And if there's ever been any wrong, it can only be my own, no matter how convinced my mind is, or how convincing Iblis is to me that you're the one unfair, I can never get myself to blame you. I will, even if I've done wrong, and it seems it's your fault, I will say what? I must blame myself. The difference over here is, فَبِمَا أَغْوَيْتَنِي You're the one who made me slip, Iblis says. And here he says, رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا Master, we wronged ourselves. They both make a mistake. Making a, making a mistake does not make you the devil. It is what happens after the mistake that makes you a follower of shaitan. When you justify your mistake, when you shift the blame onto Allah, when you refuse to take responsibility yourself, when you put your logic above the wisdom of Allah simply because you couldn't grasp it, because Allah will test you, Allah will teach you, but at the, at the end of the day, Wallahu bi kulli shay'in alim, wa idh qala rabbuka lil malaikati ni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. Allah knows everything and then the story of Adam because there are things in the story you just don't know. You just don't know why Allah would issue that command and then the entire plan. There are things you'll have to relegate your trust to Allah. And if you're not able to do that, then the door of Iblis is wide open. You can question Allah just like he did. And you can follow his path. From here on, you know all children of Adam are going to make mistakes. Kullu bani Adam khatta'un. All children of Adam are going to make mistakes, the Prophet told us sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But there's the, the, the sunnah of Adam alayhi salam and the sunnah of Iblis is what's going to make us different. Every human being is going to relive the story every time they make a mistake. Every time you and I sin, there's going to be either justification, well, I was under a lot of pressure. Well, I know it's, I mean, it's really hard. Allah tells us to do it, yeah, but we're not angels, we can't do everything, you know. You know, and if Allah really wanted to stop me, why didn't He? Why did He make me so weak? that I can't even help myself. It's not my fault, it's his fault. If Allah already knew, then why should I be helped? And all these questions. If you, go, if you go down that road, what leader have you already accepted? Iblis. He's giving you the same rationale that he used, that he tried to convince Adam of alayhi salam. But on the other hand, is the flip side of the story. Now, now let's compare some, some additional things. I haven't told you the crazy story yet. Actually, I just recently came across it, and it's so beautiful. I recommend everybody to find it on YouTube and watch it. It's uh, a Professor Jeffrey Lang's lecture on the purpose of life. Look it up and just listen to it. It will change your life. It really will. Professor Jeffrey Lang, purpose of life. And I'll tell you a snippet of his story now too. But before I do, in this story, when Allah Azza wa Jal describes, you know, إِنِّي جَعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفًا What we are learning first and foremost is that our coming on this earth is not a punishment. You don't, you remember I gave you the example of a manager trusted to man, man the store when the owner is gone? Is that a punishment or a responsibility? Human beings have been deemed capable of carrying a massive responsibility. And as a matter of fact, in the sequence of the story, the human being had to be trained to be ready for that responsibility. The responsibility to carry out the role of Khalifa on this earth is not a small responsibility. It is a massive, massive, massive responsibility. In order to prepare the human being for that responsibility, some elements of this story will inform us. Allah Azza wa Jal taught Adam alayhi salam. Allama Adam al asma'a kullaha. We'll talk about that in depth tomorrow, inshaAllah. Adam alayhi salam was taught the names of all things. And education was necessary because the human being, in order to be a successful Khalifa on this earth, will have to live a life of knowledge. And, and Allah, the first thing Allah tells us about His favor on humanity in the first revelation is, عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ بِالْقَلَمِ عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمِ He taught the human being by the pen, our ability to read and write and preserve knowledge. The fact that I can read an author from 2,000 years ago, 
who died. What other creature has the capability of building off of a knowledge of thousands of years ago? Or learn about lands, read about lands that you've never been to, you know? And learn about wisdom that you could never have access to. There are people, like I'm reading tafsir of Imam Razi or I'm reading Ibn Ashur. I've never met these people. I've, I wasn't around when they were around. And I'm reading their words and sometimes, Wallahi al-Azim, sometimes I'm reading them and I'm like, Imam Razi, that was awesome. Like they're sitting right there. Because you get so immersed in the text like they're talking to you. I was, I was studying tafsir al-Sha'rawi, rahimahullah. He passed away after doing the tafsir of uh, Surah al-Najm. 53rd Surah of Qur'an. And I'm reading, I, I followed his tafsir from the beginning. And I got to Surah al-Najm and then there's just a dua of his passing. And I'm like, oh. Like he just passed away. When I got to that, I felt like he just passed away. <laughs> Rahimahullah. This is the gift Allah gave humanity that they can pass knowledge down. You know, this idea. This was part of our preparation for coming on this earth. Another big part of our preparation, there are, there are lots of elements of them as we get to them by the end of today. One of the, one of the aspects of our, us being ready for this world is that we're going to have to take responsibility for our choices. We're going to be given lots of choices. And Allah is going to give us the room to make those choices and we're going to have to carry the burden of those choices. And the first test of choice was given to Adam salam, and now that he learned his lesson from that, le from that experience, now he is sent on this earth because now his entire life is just going to be a series of choices. That's all it's going to be. From him and for his children, it's constantly going to be choices. Now let's compare the biblical account and the Quranic account and where it's, it's so vividly different. Human beings in the biblical account in the most popular version of the story are sent on this earth as a punishment. The Qur'an's account, the human beings are sent on this earth as a responsibility, as an amana, a trust. Inna aradna al-amana. We, we passed on the, the trust. We entrust in Surah Al-Ahzab. Hamalaha al-insan. The human being carried that trust, carried that responsibility. In the, in the, uh, in the biblical account, who, who did the devil come to? He came to Eve, and Eve went to Adam, and Adam messed up, and Adam blamed Eve, and Eve laid the devil, and Allah is angry at all of them, and He curses them and sends them to the earth, and He's especially angry at who? Eve. Ah, He's especially angry at the woman. And he, His anger is manifest in the fact that she will go through pains when she does what? When she gives birth. Now when she's pregnant, her stomach is actually called a raham. In Arabic, her stomach is called a raham. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would tell us in a hadith Qudsi, "Samay tuka bismi." Allah talked to the womb of the mother and said, "I named you with my name, because Allah's name is Ar-Rahman, and He calls it what? Ar-Raham." Subhanallah, is Allah angry at the woman or extra merciful to the woman? Subhan, it's a completely different picture. In the, the taqwa of Allah. The taqwa of Allah, how high is the status of the, the concept of the consciousness of Allah? You know, from the very beginning of this book, Hudan Lil Muttaqeen. In Surah An-Nisa, what does Allah say? وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ الَّذِي تَسَأَلُونَ بِهِ وَالْأَرْحَامِ Have taqwa of Allah and have taqwa of the womb of the mother. Have taqwa of the wombs. <laughs> it's a different picture. Human beings are, pro women, women are not cursed in this religion. The, the devil is not a serpent, but he does whisper in the Qur'an. And when he whispers, what does Allah say? فَأَزَلَّهُمَا He caused both of them to slip. He caused both of them to slip. He doesn't say, he caused her to slip, she caused him to slip. He says, both of them. Who does Allah hold responsible? Both of them. And as a matter of fact, who was the head of the household? Adam alayhi salam. And that's why in some places Allah Azza wa Jal holds both of them responsible. And when he does single one out, instead of singling out the woman, who does he single out? Adam alayhi salam. Fa'asa Adam Rabbahu. Adam alayhi salam disobeyed. Even though both of them slipped, Allah Azza wa Jal holds the head of the household responsible. The story is completely different now. This is not the popular version. From who is held responsible? for what the role on the earth is, then the, the life on this earth was a curse. And Allah Azza wa in this surah and in Surah Al-A'raf, He did the same thing. Here He says, هُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا He made for you whatever is on the earth. He made it as a gift for you. I kept telling you before also, the one who made the earth as a bedding, and you know, He, he sent water from the sky, He pr produced all kinds of fruit. 
Did he make this world uncomfortable? Did he, does it look like this world is a curse? He made this world literally a preview of heaven. A preview of Jannah. Everything Allah describes in Jannah, I think the audience here knows. Call, can you tell me some things that are described in Jannah? What's described? You can call it out, it's okay. Gardens? Rivers? Fruits? Drinks? Beautiful spouse? Yeah? These are things that are described in Jannah. Why do you think these things are attractive to you? <laughs> Why would fruit be attractive to you? Or my favorite, lahmi tayrim mimma yashtahun. I keep talking about it, the flesh of bird that they shall desire. What kind of barbecue that's going to be, Allahu alam. But why would that even intrigue me? Because I've had chicken. Because I've had roast duck. Because I've had quail. Because I had pigeon. I had, yes I have, it's pretty good. You know, <laughs> you know. Everything Allah describes in Jannah only, is only attractive to me because I can only imagine it in the sense of what I find in dunya. If Allah talked about some alien pleasures in Jannah of things that I've never heard of or not even got a tease of or nothing, why would I be interested? Why would I, be, why would I want, I really want to go to Jannah? It has, and I, now it's, it's, Allah says it has rivers. If I had never seen a river, what, about, what do I care about it? What's a river anyway? It has beautiful trees. What's a tree? <laughs> Those words that Allah used, what am I, even though the ones in Jannah are incomparable, the fact that Allah put the same exact things on this earth, He did that, so we would remember by looking at this earth that there's a much better home waiting for you. This is just a trailer, the full feature is later. That was the purpose of this earth. That's why He didn't put you here as a curse. He put you here to remind you, carry your responsibilities well, and even this place will become wonderful for you. And if you do, you will have the best of this and the best of the next. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ that's, that's, the, that's the legacy of humanity. That was the gift Allah Azza wa Jal gave. That's why in Surah Al-A'raf He says, وَجَعَلْنَا لَكُمْ فِيهَا مَعَايِشِ He put in this world for you means of living well. He provided luxuries for you here. He did that for a reason. It's, this is cert most certainly not a curse. That's the second concept I wanted to get across to you. We are not a cursed creation. Then the next problem, and this is where I want to share some things from Professor Jeffrey Lang's lecture, fascinating lecture. I'm just blown away by the man. Very completely just uh, mesmerized by this talk. He was, uh, he was raised in a difficult home. His mom was a wonderful lady. She was a nurse, she used to do extra hours at the hospital. Everybody loved her. Every time he went to pick her up from the hospital, you know, the patients would sing her praises and say, your mother's a saint. She, you know, and when she passed away, literally people kept coming at the funeral telling him a story about the goodness of his mother. Just a really wonderful human being. Very source of great positive influence in his life for he and his, his, his brothers, right? And his father was an alcoholic, he was abusive, he used to beat him, he used to beat his, his wife regular, on a regular basis. Curse, and he's never heard his mother curse, not once. And he used to beat him, beat, beat the mother, and he was a very abusive man. And by the age of 16, he just couldn't figure this out. And he was raised, you know, Catholic, and he's like raised in a faith, and his mom was a, a strong believer and everything. But he said, what kind of God lets this happen? What has she ever done to deserve this? What have I ever done to deserve this kind of beating all the time? And he, he kept praying to God to make his situation better. But did his situation get better? No. And you keep praying as a child and your prayers don't get answered, what's going to happen? Is, is there even anybody listening? It can't be a God. I mean, if there was, why would this be happening? So he lost his entire faith in humanity because he said, if, if there really was a God, why even make us? Why not just make us all good? Why let all this evil happen? Why people get, and then he said, you know, he was, his teens were spent in the 60s and, and the 70s, and so there are race riots, there are gang fights, some he was even, he was even a part of, and there's like, you know, the, the impeachment of a president, the assassination of a president in front of this, the world is in chaos. And you know, Vietnam is going on, and you know, the napalm is being thrown, and children are burning alive in, in Vietnam, what have they ever done to burn alive? And he's seeing all of this evil, and it only reinforces in him, the world is far to corrupt, too corrupt, too evil, too, too, too obsessed with the shedding of blood and doing wrong to one another for this to be the product of a merciful, loving God. That, that just can't, doesn't make any sense to me. He couldn't reconcile those two things. Many years later, he's 27, 28 years old, somebody gives him a copy of Qur'an as a present. Never reads it, one day he's sitting at home, 
and he's bored, he ran out of things to read, so he opens up the Quran and starts reading. From Fatiha, he's reading, 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 he gets to Baqarah. And he's been to Catholic school, he's been to Sunday school, he understands the story the way I told you before. And he reads it and he goes, the author, because he doesn't know it's God, right? So he goes, the author must have got it wrong. What, what's he saying? He, I think the author missed the point. The point was we're sent here as a curse. But he starts off with Khalifa as an emissary, as someone to represent God's will, to do good on the earth. What? This is not a, good, this is not a happy story. Why is this a happy story here? I don't get it. And he thought the author was confused. So he read the story in translation over again, and then over again. He says 20, 30 times, he kept reading the same story, and he kept finding things that kept messing with him. And he says, God says he's going to put this creature on the earth, and the angel said what? What the Quran says. What did the angel say? He's going to cause corruption and spill blood. And Professor Lang says, exactly. That's what I would have said. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Because that's what surrounded him, right? Yeah. So he's looking at this and saying, wow, the angels are onto something in his book. The author is retelling the story. Uh, I guess he's got the same issues I do. <laughs> you know? Because the angels are asking, why did you even do this? Why would you do this? And you know, and they said, نَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ We declare your perfection. Look, yeah, why not just make us all angels? Why do you even have to make an earth? Heaven's already there. Just make more angels. If you really want to do something, this is working fine. Why do you have to make this messy creature who's gonna... And then God comes around and says, I know what you don't. I know what you don't know. He's like, what does God know that... I don't know. And he starts, he says, as I used to read this over and over, I used to actually start having conversations with the author, still being an atheist. What do you know? <laughs> that I don't know. Please tell me, because all my life I haven't known. I'd like to know. And then the Qur'an's answer, he taught Adam the names of all things. And then he presented them before the angels. I'm summarizing, we're going to go into depth later on. But I'm giving you the overview now, right? So he taught him the names of all things. And he presented Adam before the angels. And said, Tell me the names of these things and these people. They said, we can't. We, I mean, we have no knowledge of this. And then he asks Adam, He threw the, name, the names out without a problem. Apparently, God said, yes, human beings may be capable of corruption, bloodshed, but I'm going to give the human being something that you don't have, angels don't have. I'm going to teach him. I'm going to teach him. And he's going to learn. And he's going to have knowledge. And this knowledge is going to liberate him. And he's going to be capable of amazing things because of this first thing that Allah is mentioning, which is what? Knowledge, his intellect, his inquiry. His ability to discover on this earth. And even by this point, the professor's like, we're just supposed to believe and not question. And you can't learn if you don't what? If you don't question, if you don't investigate. The human being is awesome because he's a learner? Really? And that's the secret? That Allah knows what you don't, what he don't, what, what he, you know, you don't know what the angels don't know, and that's part of that secret is his knowledge, the ability for the human being to learn with the pen, to pass knowledge down, to inquire, to investigate. And then he says, as he's reading even more, what he, what, what he found fascinating was, Allah, what did Allah say to Adam alayhi salam? Here, live with your spouse in Jannah. Don't go near. Tilka shajara. Don't go near this tree. There's no fiery security guard standing next to the tree. There's no mention of the tree of good and evil that you shall know. It's just a tree. Just a tree. And our Mufassirun are baffled. What, what kind of tree was it? I wonder if it was pineapple or, you know. If Allah wanted you to know, what would He have done? All He wanted to tell you is it's a tree. Good enough. Doesn't seem like a huge deal. Just look, it's a prohibition. It's a test, that's all. I just don't want you to go near this tree. That's it. You know, don't overthink it. And if you do, you'll be among those who do wrong. And there's not, you're going to be the ones who do wrong if you do so. It's not, I'm going to burn you. You're going to suffer. You're going to be punished. I shall curse you. And there's nothing. It's like, this God is not angry. Why isn't he mad? He's reading this and he's like, why isn't he, like, this God is supposed to like 
put the fear of hell into the, to, to Adam to not go near this tree. But he's simply like, hey, there's a tree. Can you stay away from that one? He seems pretty chill about the whole thing. And then when the angel, when, 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 when the devil finally does whisper, he doesn't whisper to him, he whispers to both. And what does he say? Azallahuma. He caused them to slip. So the professor says, I couldn't believe it. The biggest mistake made in human history for which we are cursed on this planet. And this book calls it a slip? A slip is, I accidentally wore your shoes out of the masjid. That's a slip. <laughs> this is a slip? This is not a slip. This must be a bad translation. So he found, he says, it's so cute. He says, I found my Arabian friends. <laughs> And could you translate this word for word for me? And they're like, fa so azallahuma shaitan. Shaitan caused them to Ca cause them to what? What's azallah? What, what's that word? Slip. Go slip? Really? <laughs> he couldn't handle it because this was such a big deal in the biblical account and the Quran. All shaitan is able to do is make the human being what? Slip. And if you compare this to other sins, what sins were? The angels worried about. Were the angels worried about Adam's gonna eat from a fruit, you know? They're worried about the spilling of blood, the causing of corruption, mass murder, genocide, rape, all kinds of things happened on this earth. Compare them to the eating of a tree, eating of a fruit. It is at the end of the day, if, from any measure of human intellect, it looks like a slip. It's a slip. So it's accurately described as shaitan successful in causing them to. Slip. And by the way, the idea of a slip is, once you slip, you what? You fall. In other words, the slip is the first part of a series of unfortunate events. Like, imagine somebody slips at the top of stairs. What happens? They keep falling, right? The idea is the first time you disobey Allah, maybe something small, but it leads you down a path. You keep on falling. You keep on descending. And that's, it's interesting that the word azalla was used, and then ihbitu, descend, is used later on. Because when you slip, you do descend. So there's a literary connection there too. But anyway, so Allah tests them, and he slips, and he, they, mess, they mess up. Now, it's, now he's like, now the cursing is going to begin. Now the woman and her womb. Now the, you know, the punishment of hell. Now the cursed life on earth. You shall toil, and you shall suffer, and all of it. And Allah Azza wa Jal just says, uh, descend from here. Come down from here. You're, all, you're going to be enemies to each other. Who is he talking to? He's talking to Adam and Iblis. Adam and Hawa being enemies to who? Iblis. He came to you as a friend. He convinced you to eat from that tree, pretending to be your friend. But the reality is, when you live here, now you know you are going to be what? Enemies to each other. But he will always come to you not as an enemy. He will always come to you as? A friend. So watch out now that you know. And then he says, okay, now, this, now, now the next part, okay, fine, they're gonna be, we're going to be enemies to each other, great. Now how horrible is the life on the earth going to be? وَلَكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُسْتَقَرٌ You're going to have a place to relax on the earth, to stay in ease. وَمَتَاعٌ إِلَى حِينٍ You're going to have provision and things to enjoy until a limited time. For a temporary while, you'll have to stay here. Does that sound like a curse? Does it sound like a punishment? He was so underwhelmed, like, where's the epic anger? It disappeared. Okay, at least in the next verse or something, he's going to say, then God showed him what's, what's really up, and showed him the consequences of his deeds. The next words are, فَتَلَقَى آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ Adam السلام, came into contact with words from his master, and, Allah turned, and he turned back to Allah, he, he re repented to Allah, and Allah accepts repentance all the time, it's all good, it's okay you slipped, now you can move on with your life. You don't live in sin, you're not cursed, you're not, humanity's not descending into evil, and none of it. فَتَلَقَى آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ Subhanallah. But Adam used to live where? In Jannah. Now where is he? On earth. On earth there are emotions Adam has never felt before. There's fear on the earth. There's sadness on the earth. There's pain on the earth. None of these, none of these experiences exist where? In Jannah. There's hunger on the earth, fear on the earth, sadness on the earth. You know. There's concern on the earth. There's stress on the earth. There are all these negative emotions. So Adam alayhi salam is terrified. And Hawa is terrified. What are, how are we going to live here? It is difficult. And so what does Allah do? Well, come down. But you know what? I'll give you, I'll give you how to manage your life here. فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدًا فَمَنْ تَبِعَهُ دَايَا فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْسَنُونَ Listen. 
come, come on this earth altogether, fine, descend here, but whenever I send you any guidance, whoever follows it, they won't have to experience any fear, and they're not going to be sad. The two major emotions that, that run humanity into the ground are fear and sadness. Let me tell you, these are the two root you know, uh, negative emotions in the entire human experience. Why do, why do animals attack? Sometimes they attack out of fear, right? Sometimes war happened, they say preemptive war. You know what that means? One nation was afraid that the other nation was going to attack, so they attack ahead of time. We were afraid they might do something. Fear will make a person do crazy things. There's a fear of poverty, or the fear of bankruptcy might make someone take up a haram job. Fear is a powerful motivator for a lot of evil in the world. On the flip side is what, what emotion? Sadness. Now, fear, by the way, is always related to the future. And sadness related to the past. And the past, the sadness of the past, when you're, when you're, first thing it does is it makes you lose hope. And when you lose hope, then you become a source of hopelessness for the people around you. And when sadness grows inside you, it turns into anger and rage also. And when people are angry and, 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 and vengeful, then all kinds of evil comes from them. Sadness is actually the root cause of a lot of evil on the earth. So is fear. Allah says, I'll give you a manual, it will help you manage your fear, and it will help you manage your sadness. And that's how you'll be able to navigate this temporary existence on the earth, then you can come back home. Then you can come back to Jannah. Just live by this, this manual, this guidance for a little bit. SubhanAllah. It's a completely different account from what the world had known. It gives a completely different picture to what the world had known. In these few minutes I have left, I do want to share one more overview concept with you and then inshallah from tomorrow on, we get into this just absolutely remarkably beautiful ayat. Um, the last concept I want to share with you, rather philosophical some consider, the problem, they say the problem of suffering. The problem of suffering. You know, in different philosophies, in different world views, suffering is looked at differently. Like there are certain philosophies in, in which suffering, you can, o you can only overcome it by meditation. And if you meditate enough, then you will no longer feel pain and you'll hover in the air and all kinds of stuff, right? Others say, well, suffering is just the, your fate. You're supposed to suffer because, you know, this world is about suffering. So just accept it, you know? Or suffering exists because of your sins. It's something you did, and that's, as a result, you have suffering. But we, you and I both know there are plenty of people that suffer in this world for nothing they did. Children suffer. There are children that have cancer. There are, you know, there, there are seniors that have been worshipping Allah their entire lives, and they're suffering from sickness. You're earning a, a, a decent living for your family, doing the right thing, and somebody else comes and rams their car into you. You're suffering. Not because of something you did, you were driving just fine. Suffering exists, and a lot of it is not because of what you did. So the question of it is, has always baffled humanity, and for a lot of people who don't believe in God, they're actually, their number one problem is what? Is suffering. How does the Qur'an deal with the problem of suffering? The Qur'an actually tells humanity to embrace it. You were sent temporarily on this earth, and this world will in fact have suffering. We will absolutely test you. We will absolutely put you to the test with all kinds of suffering. You're going to feel hunger. You're going to feel ter terrified. You're going to feel hunger. You're going to see loss of children loss of fruit, loss of the fruit of your labor, you're going to work hard and still not get paid sometimes, your boss swallowed all the money, your partner ran away with the money, all kinds of unfair things will happen to you in this world. This is the world that I've put you in. I, I didn't put, just put any creature on this earth, I put a Khalifa on this earth. These kinds of challenges, not any creation of Allah could handle, you are capable of handling them. You're capable of going through this difficulty and still coming out strong on the other end. These will all be, and you will be able to do so with your connection to Allah, your knowledge and your wisdom. That's how you're going to be able to navigate. This is what guidance will help you do. Uh, we are actually told in this religion not to run from suffering, but to actually embrace it. And to ask Allah to give us the strength to go through it. وَثَبِّتَ قَدَامَنَا Make our feet firm. Help us pass through it. You know? And then, you know, there is khawf and ju' and you know, there's sadness, but on the other hand, this book, this word of Allah, this connection with Allah, it'll help you navigate through all of that sadness. It's a realistic look at life. There's no escape from suffering in the Qur'an. There's no escape from difficulty. Difficulty and challenges and tests will come, but then again, you're qualified to handle them. He would not have, no human being suffers any difficulty in this world, according to Allah Azza wa Jal, that they were not able to bear. If you were put through something, it's because you were capable of it. If you went through something, and as unfair as you and I might think it is, 
Why did I have to go through this? Why did I have to suffer through this? It has a purpose. It has a purpose and first and foremost, you had to go through it because you were the only one suited for it. You're the only one suited for it. There are some challenges in your life that I don't have. There are some challenges in my life that you don't have. The challenges in your life, Allah custom designed for you. Because only you could have handled them. The challenges in my life, only Allah put for me. Because only I could have handled them. وَبَشِّرَ الصَّابِرِينَ If people can persevere through them, congratulations to them. Then they've passed the test. That's the remarkable accomplishment of the human being. You know, I'm reminded of the story of Robert. Uh, some of you are familiar, uh, it became pretty viral back in the day, Robert de Villa when I, when I met with him and you know, all of that. And Robert sometimes, I, I, I wonder about him, like completely paralyzed. What could be, what possibly could be the good in that? And the good is obvious. How many countless people are finding their way to guidance and becoming grateful to Allah just by watching a clip of Robert? Just by watching a clip. Like, he's doing more good, not moving a single limb of his body than people that are like Olympic athletes couldn't do. They couldn't do that much good that he can do lying in a bed. SubhanAllah. This is, Allah has his own design. Allah has his own purpose. And all of it is, is summed up so, so beautifully inside of this story. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us of those who rely on Him, who understand the wisdom in the, in the remarkable narrative of the Qur'an, and are able to enlighten the rest of the world with this beautiful guidance. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim, wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah. <laughs>